Welcome to Electron Line and here our next video regarding atomic structure or electron structures in atoms. We're going to look at the Bohr atom. Of course the Bohr atom is the simple atom, the hydrogen atom with a single proton and a single electron. And we're going to look at that in ways of showing how the classical way of looking at the atom where we have two particles, the electron being a small particle, the proton being a smart particle, how we can calculate the velocity of the electron going around the nucleus using classical methods and we're going to do the same to show that there's a particle and wave duality for the electron in the Bohr atom and we're going to find the same, the velocity, using the concept of Niels Bohr who said that electrons have waves just like photons. So let's do that. So first of all, in a classical sense, we have a small negative charge going around a large positive charge like that. And when I say large positive charge, it's just large in mass, not large in charge, because of course the charge of the proton and charge of the electron are exactly equal, except opposite in sign. So we, we call Q, the big Q, the charge on the proton, which is a positive electron charge. And then the absolute value of the electron is also a positive electron charge. We're just going to call it positive for now because it doesn't really matter. And we use the small e to indicate one single charge, one quantum charge belonging to either the proton or the electron. So using Coulomb's law, we can say that the force of attraction between the two charges can be found by using Coulomb's law right here. We'll figure out what that equation is. And then at the same time, we have centripetal force caused by the Coulomb force and for a moment we're going to assume the fictitious centrifugal force which then opposes the Coulomb force and those two forces of course have to be equal for the electron to stay in orbit around the nucleus. So we're going to set the two forces equal to each other. This is just of course a fictitious way of looking at it to make it a little easier to understand. Basically the centripetal force is the Coulomb force and we just set them equal to each other. Now the Coulomb force from Coulomb's law is K times the charge of the proton, times the charge of the electron, divided by the radius between them squared. And of course the radius of this is the Bohr radius, that is the size of the hydrogen atom, we call it the Bohr radius, and for reference we have the reference size right here. We know that the Bohr radius has a radius of 0.53 angstroms or 0.053 nanometers, which is 10 to the minus 9 meters. So that's the Coulomb force, and we're going to set that equal to the centripetal force, which is the mass of the electron times the centripetal acceleration, which is V squared over R. And again, that R is the same R as this, which is the Bohr radius. Now, remember that we call the, the charge of the proton, the charge of the electron, simply a charge. So we call that E. And so this can be written as K times E squared divided by the radius squared is equal to MV squared divided by the radius. And right away, we can cancel this radius with that radius. And now we're going to solve that equation for the velocity. That will be the velocity of the, that the electron has to have in a, in a Bohr atom, which is a hydrogen atom, to stay in orbit around the nucleus from a classical point of view. So we have solving for V squared, we divide both sides by M, taking the square root and, well, first of all, let me just turn the equation around. So I have V squared is equal to K e squared divided by r, and then the m, of course, goes to the denominator on the other side. So I simply turn the equation around, move the m to the other side, the equal sign, and now I take the square root of both sides. So v is equal to the square root of k e squared divided by r times m. Now, therefore, the velocity is equal to, now let's plug in the numbers. So k is the constant, which is 9 e to the ninth, and matter of fact, one, I'll write them in there so you see what they are. 9 times 10 to the 9th newtons, that would be a meter squared per coulomb squared, multiply that times the charge on a single electron squared, that would be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, and of course we have to square that because we have two of them, the radius of the atom, which we have right there, which is 0.053 times 10 to the minus 9, and that would be meters, and then the mass of the electron is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. All right, so let's find out what that is equal to. So we have 9, 9 e to the 9th times 1.6 e to the 19 minus, and we have to square that, divide that by 0 0.053 e to the 9 minus, and divide by 9.1 e to the 31 minus, the mass of the electron, 
And now we take a square root of that and we get 2.19, 2.19 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. So using classical mechanics, we can figure out the speed at which the electron has to travel around the nucleus in order to stay in orbit. 2.9 times 10 to the six meters, that's 2,000 kilometers, that is like 12, 1,300 miles per second. Electrons move around the nucleus at 1,300 miles per second to stay in orbit. So you can imagine that's enormous speed. Now, does that match the, the particle wave duality principle by Niels Bohr saying that we have the wavelength of an electron is equal to h over mv. So if we solve this equation for the velocity of the electron, that is equal to h divided by the mass times the wavelength. Now, of course, the wavelength of an electron in its innermost orbit, as we saw in the previous video, we know that the, that the electron will go around the orbit like a wave, and in the innermost orbit, the orbit of the electron will be equal to one wavelength, and of course the orbit of a circle, that would be 2 pi times the radius, so the wavelength there for the innermost orbit will be 2 pi times the radius of the, of the atom. Planck's constant is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34, that would be uh, joules times seconds, divided by the mass, which is 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms, and the wavelength then of course would be 2 pi times the radius, which is 0 0.0553 times 10 to the minus 9 meters. So what we would expect now, we expect a close correlation between the classical mechanics. And if that's true, then we've shown that there's this particle wave duality for the electron. Now this h, of course, is the constant associated with small particles and quantum mechanics, which means that the velocity of the electron would have to be quantized. So you have strict velocities in different energy levels for, and because at different energy levels the wavelength would be different, and so you have quantum leaps from one to the other in the velocity of the electron. Alright, so we have 6.626 e to the 34 minus divided by 9.1 e to the 31 minus divide by 2, divide by pi and divide by 0.053e to the 9 minus equals, wow, I get the exact same result. That is quite amazing. 2.19, 2.19 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Well, you look at that, exactly the same. So when they first calculated that, they go, wow, we're actually correct here. Of course, there was a lot of doubt that electrons would behave like waves, but again, as we calculate it, we can see that, yes, in a hydrogen atom, an electron acts just as much as a particle using classical mechanics equations from Newton and Coulomb. And when we use the new equations where we say that electrons are like waves and they have wavelengths appropriate to their velocities, and then when we calculate that for the velocity, we end up with the exact same value. And therefore, we have shown that, yes, we can assume that electrons behave just as much as, they, as particles as they do as waves. There's the particle wave duality in a Bohr atom.